and welcome to the last of this week's Science Week le lectures, or those are our sessions on careers in science for anybody who is interested tomorrow to see the Science Week website. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rick Cooper, or as he will be from October, Professor Rick Cooper, who's just been had a personal chair conferred on him, and he's going to talk about the hidden complexities of routine behaviour. Rick did his first degree at the University of Newcastle, where Newcastle was in New South Wales, Australia, <laughs> before coming over to the UK to do his PhD in Edinburgh, and then a postdoc at UCL, then he joined Birkbeck in the mid-1990s, and as I say, he has risen up through the ranks, and he's been given a personal chair from this October, so there may be a chance for you to come back in about 12 months' time to hear his inaugural lecture. So I would like to introduce Rick, who's going to talk about the hidden complexities of routine behaviour. Okay. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for coming along this evening. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, you, know, you might have other things that you could normally do in, in, on a uh, Thursday evening. I hope to convince you, though, uh, that uh, routine behaviour is, is not something that um, we can sort of take for granted. It's something that you know, we all are engaged in most of our lives, um, and yet what I want to convince you is that there are actually some sort of complexities there, and I want to try to uh, illustrate to you how we can understand those complexities through uh, the techniques of computational modelling and simulation. Um, and I'll be using um, a lot of computational work in this talk, but I'll also be referring a lot to um, the uh, breakdown in the control of routine behaviour that is sometimes uh, seen following neurological injury, following stroke or uh, head injury, and that sort of thing. So here's basically uh, the plan. Um, I have probably more material than I can cover in an hour, and I, I may certainly not get to uh, the final point. But I'll start off um, with a, an overview of what I mean by routine behaviour, why it's interesting, um, and then go into what is kind of the, the meat of the data that we're interested in, the sort of slips and lapses in routine behaviour, the errors that we make in routine behaviour uh, on a daily basis, and also the pathologies of routine behaviour, the sorts of problems that some uh, brain injured patients have in performing uh, re behavioural routines. These behavioural routines tend to be uh, things that we, as I say, the things that we perform on a daily basis, things like dressing, grooming, commuting, and all these sorts of things. And so if the uh, patients have problems with those, they're very debilitating. Um, looking at those errors, though, we can uh, derive or build up a theory of how routine behaviour is controlled in, in the human. And I'll look at a computational model of that, um, look at normal and impaired functioning within the model and some of the implications there, and hopefully, if time permits, go on to uh, look at how that model might be extended to non-routine behaviour. So, routine behaviour. The point is that much of uh, our daily life is routine drud drudgery. We're consumed with things like uh, activities of daily living, Dressing, grooming, preparing and eating meals, cleaning, commuting. Um, you know, probably 95% of our time is spent doing this. Uh, and in the modern world, we even sort of spend the rest of our time with everyday uh, tasks like driving and typing these days, tasks which again um, become very routine. You know, 20 years ago, typing was not that routine, uh, um, except amongst uh, you know, those who are engaged in sort of administrative tasks. But these days, everyone uh, is typing uh, for a large proportion of the time. Driving is another routine skill. Um, even expert behaviours for those people who are experts and are practising these on a daily basis, playing a musical instrument or playing you know, tennis or football given this time of, of year, or even uh, for academics giving lectures if you've been giving them for long enough, become routines. So routine tasks involve um, the selection of a frequently performed sequence of actions in the service of some sort of relatively short-term goal, so you know, not a, not a long-term goal that's lasting months or years, um, and usually within a f relatively stable or predictable environment. And it's sort of the nature, because we have things like that stable and predictable environment, that we can actually um, sort of take advantage of that in, in performing routine actions. Now, if a routine task required the same level of attention as something like playing chess or debugging a computer program or, or doing whatever that um, you do that requires sort of concentration, then we'd get nothing else done. We'd spend all of our lives just sort of planning the next sentence that we're about to say. So um, the, 
and in another, uh, other cases, there really just isn't time to fully plan each action. So because the environment is sort of relatively uh, changing in a relatively fast-paced way, um, you can't always plan what you're going to be doing before you start doing it. If you consider the case of playing a musical instrument, for example, um, you have to sort of execute the motor commands very, very quickly. There isn't time to be able to plan what you are going to be doing within you know, the next sort of hundreds of milliseconds. Um, so the idea is that um, within routine behavior, we can sort of take advantage of the fact that we do things um, in a relatively uh, sort of in the same way uh, in most cases and sort of trade off some kind of accuracy against the cost of selecting the most appropriate action at each time. So we can sort of build up um, a schematic structure for action um, and apply that schematic structure in new, uh, you know, over and over again. And occasionally we might make errors, um, but the point is by using that schematic structure, using that structure that's usually the right structure and rather than replanning every time, um, we save the cost of sort of having to plan on a moment by moment basis and it frees us up to do other things. It frees us up to, it offloads the control of routine behavior basically to a specialized system, frees us up to do other things, to think about other things, have sort of more interesting thoughts and do more interesting things. We don't have to you know, think about how to plan our walking uh, while we're thinking about other things. If we did, we'd spend all of our lives, you know, as I say, planning our walking or planning our next move and we wouldn't be able to do anything you know, creative or think about anything else. So the problem about um, routine behavior, why is it important? It's important for a number of uh, reasons. Firstly, um, it's cognitively demanding and um, inefficient, really, to maintain attention to boring tasks. If you're doing some kind of very repetitive task uh, or a task that you do on a daily basis, uh, you know, or if you're typing, for example, and you're paying attention to every letter that you're typing, it's cognitively demanding to do that. Um, and it's also inefficient to do that. It's, it's sort of wasting your, um, your valuable cognitive resources focusing on the individual key presses rather than maybe focusing on, say, sentence structure. Um, but because it's cognitively demanding, routine tasks are also prone to error. Um, routine tasks are also prone to error following interruptions. So we'll see that, you know, or you, you, I'm sure you'll be aware that if you're performing some sort of task that you perform on a daily basis and you're interrupted, you go back to it, you forget where was I up to, uh, and often that's sort of also a, a source of sort of errors occurring sort of shortly after the interruption. Errors might have catastrophic consequences. A lot of vehicle collisions and industrial accidents can be attributed to the sorts of errors that occur um, or that are made in a routine task. So people are performing this routine task, maybe a machine operator is performing a routine task or you're driving a very routine task, because it's so routine and mundane, your attention tends to wander, uh, and then something unexpected happens, and you end up with a, a, with a collision. So you know, it is important to try to reduce errors in routine tasks. So understanding routine behavior hopefully will allow us to understand why errors occur in routine tasks and how they may be minimized. A second reason for why routine behavior is important um, is to support patients. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, compromised control of routine behavior following you know, stroke, traumatic brain injury, dementia, um, these sorts of things may result in the inability to do, perform activities of daily living, ADL as the healthcare professionals call them. And that results in patients having very high dependence on caregivers. As I said, these routine uh, tasks are things that we do on a daily basis over and over again, dressing, um, preparing meals and so on. If uh, you have problems in performing such routine tasks, then you're going to be highly dependent upon your caregivers. Now, there's always the, the prospect that maybe technology can help us here. Maybe technology can sort of provide systems, provide uh, ways of understanding how to support patients uh, so that they are less dependent, to provide patients with more independence. So again, understanding routine behavior will hopefully allow us to develop more successful rehabilitation therapies or provide maybe environmental scaffolding that minimizes errors. Um, a third reason why routine behavior is important is um, robotics. As I've said, mundane tasks are boring. The tasks that we don't really want to do if we can avoid them a lot of the time. Um, so, you know, if we could understand how routine behavior is controlled, then we can develop robots, for example, to do tasks like cleaning. And of course, there are 
now robot hoovers are around that are able to sort of hoover rooms and do sort of some, some kind of uh, the beginnings of some tasks like that. Um, but other tasks are hazardous. Things like uh, search and rescue within, um, you know, after the, uh, the Japanese tsunami, for example, working within a, a radioactive environment. Um, or working within areas where there's risk of, of fire or building collapse or so on, you might want to send robots in. Sometimes uh, you might want to send those robots to places like Mars. The problem with Mars is it's a long way away. It takes a very long time for any control signal to get there and back. So we need the robot to be autonomous. We need the robot to be able to carry on sort of doing some sensible things in the absence of um, control from us. So understand, again, understanding routine behavior there is going to be an important uh, aspect in all of those things. Finally, um, a reason to, un to uh, why understanding routine behavior is important is in changing habits. Um, so habits are, of course, uh, one of these sort of routine behaviors. You know, maybe it's uh, a habit like you know, having a cigarette on the way to or from the tube station or something that you're trying to break. Um, maybe, uh, as, as with colleagues over at the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, it's trying to understand how to change people's public health behaviours, how to introduce flossing as part of a toothbrushing routine, for example. Um, or again, one of my colleagues over there has been interested in how to introduce um, uh, hand washing as part of the toileting routine in a lot of sort of uh, Afri sub-Saharan African countries. So these are sort of real issues about how we can understand routine behaviour and how we can use that understanding to alter uh, or to... to uh, either alter behavior or construct artifacts, construct robots or so on uh, to help us. So we have, uh, I guess, some key questions. How are humans able to perform routine tasks with little or no overt attention? You know, these are sorts of tasks, these routines, we don't have to pay attention constantly. Uh, we can perform a second attentionally demanding task at the same time, usually without making error. But then occasionally the errors creep in. Why do those errors occur? Um, and sometimes those errors creep in you know, when we're doing a secondary task, when we're trying to do two things at once, sometimes those errors creep in even when we're not trying to do two things at once. Uh, assuming that errors are undesirable, how can we minimize them? Um, and uh, finally, yes, can we design artifacts to sort of counter the, the increase in errors that uh, tends to follow uh, from neural injury, brain injury? So that's the sort of the, the motivation as I said, the, the meat of this, though, really comes down to the sorts of errors that people make. So here are um, some slips and lapses in routine action that um, have been documented in various places. Some, the last one I observed, but a number of them uh, documented in uh, diary studies where psychologists have asked um, subjects, just the, the standard um, people who have enrolled in their experiments, to just to keep a, a diary of when they make errors and uh, you know, what time of day it is, what they were doing, what the error was, and so on. So uh, one of these people, James Reeson from Manchester, uh, produced uh, or found errors like this. I was using a copying machine after I'd just been, um, this person had just been uh, playing cards, and he or she counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Jack, Queen, King. So he sort of continued counting with that sort of card routine uh, rather than counting the number of copies, you know, 11, 12, 13. Hopefully these sorts of errors, although everyone sort of laughs and smiles a bit, hopefully these are errors that you recognize in your own behavior. Um, very few people, occasionally people deny that they make these errors and um, I don't generally believe them. Um, but uh, there's also been some suggestions that the more, that the higher your IQ, the more likely you are to make errors of this sort. Anyway, uh, so that sort of is, is this idea behind the mad professor. Um, so this one, uh, I intended to stop off on the way home to buy some fish, but after following my usual route, I arrived home fishless. Uh, I started to pour a second kettle of boiling water into a teapot of freshly made tea. I had no recollection of having just made it. Uh, I intended to put the lid on the sugar bowl. Instead, I put it on the coffee cup, which was a similar size. Uh, and this one, which I um, observed somebody in front of me at a cash machine, uh, he was in, seemed to be in a hurry. Uh, put his card in, whatever got his, his card back out and walked off, and then the cash came out ready for me. <laughs> I did call him back, and he was obviously very grateful. Um, but, you know, this is sort of a, a standard. These errors are common in everyday behavior. And just to show how common these are, um, this is sort of one that's very easy. It's very easy to find images of this on the, on the Internet. So I couldn't find images for all of the others. But a standard error 
um, that seems to happen a lot, not just, well, I used to think this was just in, in the US, but it's not. I mean, this is clearly, uh, I don't know, that's Thailand or somewhere. And uh, anyway, forgetting to take the, uh, the, the Bowser sort of nozzle out of the car and then driving off with it in, clearly you, you lead to this, uh, results in this kind of mistake. Uh, but as I say, these sorts of routine errors can lead to sort of much more um, catastrophic sorts of um, situations. It's bad enough if you sort of rip that off the, from the petrol station. Now, if we look at these uh, routine errors, and uh, you know, this is work that um, has been done by, as I say, James Reason and, and Don Norman as well. They did these large diary studies. Um, the sorts of errors that people report cluster into a into number of different natural categories, and those natural categories tell us something about how the human uh, routine behavior system works. Um, so some are these so-called capture errors, where one behavior drifts into another behavior. So we had that with the counting cards. Um, this person, I meant to get my car out, but as I passed through the back porch on the way to the garage, I stopped to put on my Wellington boots and gardening jacket. So again, uh, one behavior that's fairly routine, probably, getting his car out of the, the garage, sort of drifts into another behavior that's again fairly routine, um, working in the garden. And uh, another one, I decided to cut down my sugar consumption, wanted to um, have my cornflakes without sugar, but um, you know, a moment later I realized that there was sugar on the cereal as always. Um, and you know that, well, so there's all of those, what they have in common is this idea of one behavior drifting into another. But then there are other errors, um, which we might classify as emission errors. So this case of forgetting to buy something on the way home. Um, this one, sitting in the car about to leave for work, I realized I'd put the car in gear and release the handbrake, but uh, hadn't started the engine. Uh, and uh, let's see, so this is a, a nice one where um, my wife, <laughs> so we know now who X is, um, took the, she was preparing a cup of tea she um, you know, was doing everything normally, took the milk out, opened the milk, and shortly later closed the milk and put it back in the fridge and there was no milk in the tea. The last one I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, sending an email without an attachment. Again, all of these are cases where we omit an action. They're quite different to those um, capture errors. Uh, perseverative errors, cases where we perseverate or persevere. We repeat an action despite the fact that we've already done it and it's no longer necessary. So boiling that second kettle or... Um, this is one who, uh, somebody who you know, put a cigarette in their mouth and then got another cigarette out of the packet. Um, another case of this person X removing two cereal bowls from the drying tray and then moments later getting two cereal bowls out of the cupboard and uh, forgetting that um, she had already removed, um, already had two cereal bowls on the table. Um, so again, I guess what's common across all of those errors is this perseveration, repeating or uh, you're repeating a, a, an action even though the goal has been achieved. And again, I want to say that's telling us something about how action is organized or how action is controlled within the human. Uh, another category, I mean, there are many, many of these categories or many, the, they are sort of cluster into many different types. I won't go through absolutely all of them, but I do want to give you this sort of strong flavor of them. So substitution errors are another good um, case. I intended to put the lid on the sugar bowl and instead I put it on the cup. Um, or I caught myself as I was about to pour the tea into the opened empty can of tomatoes that was just to the left of the teacup. So you can imagine a sort of a cluttered work surface and somebody about to pour the tea into the tomato tin, which is you know, roughly the same size as a, as a teacup maybe. It's still a container. Um, it's not entirely implausible. Um, this one I intended to throw the tissue into the bin. Instead, I put it into the laundry basket, which was next to the bin. Um, that's one that I... I did. I don't know if I can include my own errors here. Um, this is another one that I think is, is very interesting because it shows the sort of substitution of one uh, thing that we're meant to do. So X emptied one packet of sugar into a coffee and discarded the empty packet into a nearby dirty mug in the coffee shop. Took a second packet of sugar, poured the contents into the dirty mug. <laughs> um, and you can see this, this dirty mug has somehow suddenly become sort of the target for the action. So it was the target for... Um, disposing of one sugar packet, but then it becomes the target for adding sugar, which is, you know, the target should have been the original coffee mug. Um, and one last type of error I want to mention, just because it's um, very common and very um, 
an important error that people involved in uh, human-computer interaction uh, sort of try to avoid is a post-completion error, which is a certain type of omission error where you leave out the last action in a sequence. Um, normally, that last action occurs after somehow sort of achieving the main goal. So this is a case of this person getting his card back from the machine and leaving and forgetting to collect the cash. Um, again, photocopying confidential documents and leaving the document. Well, it doesn't have to be confidential, but it seems to always happen when they are. Um, leaving the document on the photocopier, the original on the photocopier. Leaving your memory stick on a public computer um, or forgetting to put the petrol cap back on the car and so on. So again, these are all errors which occur after the main goal is, is achieved and uh, we somehow sort of forget to do those subsidiary clean up, clean up actions. So they're the sorts of things that um, people without brain injury tend to, to do quite frequently. Um, and you know, it's, it's always difficult to know how frequently you make these sorts of errors because you really need to, uh, it's very hard to know how to exactly study it. What you really need is something like uh, you know, video cameras constantly monitoring your action, um, but then you also have to sort of confess to what you actually intended and sort of map those two together. Um, but certainly on a daily basis, I think people, most people make these sorts of action slips. Um, but as I say, neurological patients have much, can have um, a much more difficult time. And there's a range of different syndromes um, that cause problems with routine behavior. Um, start with utilization behavior, um, documented sort of extensively, I guess, in the 1980s by a French neurologist, neurologist uh, Lemit. Um, and uh, he had a patient where he gave the patient a pair of spectacles, the patient put them on, gave the patient another pair of spectacles, and again, the patient put those on as well. So, in fact, I think I have the picture here of the patient who's got now two pairs of spectacles on. He seems to sort of, his behavior, uh, his action is driven very much by what's in the environment. Um, you know, pair of spectacles, you put it on, rather than sort of the realization that he's actually already got a pair on. Um, Another example, the patient was seated at a desk talking with two neuro neuropsychologists um, and he reached across the table to a tray that was placed at the far end. Um, the tray had been deliberately placed there by the neuropsychologist. They were um, sort of interested to see whether this would provoke any utilization behavior. The patient pulled out a deck of playing cards and started dealing them to each of the, um, the, the people seated there. Critically, this was not something that happened with all patients, all neurological patients. Neuropsychologists had sort of uh, did these clinical examinations of a whole range of patients, but there were one patient who was particularly susceptible to having his action driven by the environment, utilizing objects in the environment. Um, another case that's kind of quite closely related is an archaic hand syndrome or alien hand syndrome, as it's sometimes called. Uh, if anyone remembers the film uh, Dr. Strangelove with Peter Sellers, they might remember the main character having um, a problem where one hand tended to do one thing and the other hand, you know, one hand tended to do things that he didn't want it to do and he was always trying to uh, control that hand by sitting on it or holding it and so on. Um, this is actually a, a real condition, an archaic hand syndrome. So um, this uh, example here from Della Sala, the patient had a steaming cup of tea in front of her. The right hand proceeded to pick it up and bring it to her mouth, uh, even though the patient knew that it was too hot and had just said she would wait a few minutes to, to it. Um, it had cooled so she had to actually intervene with her, her other hand to stop this one hand from being driven by the environment just performing these object appropriate actions um, those sorts of behaviors are or syndromes are relatively rare much more common um, is something which sometimes people refer to as frontal apraxia sometimes it's referred to as action disorganization syndrome and this often occurs following um, a brain injury to the frontal lobes. And that brain injury might be through stroke or it might be through some kind of traumatic brain injury, uh, you know, a car accident where you suffer a, a severe blow to the head, for example. Um, and here, especially sort of shortly after the trauma, in the early stages of recovery, um, routine action can be very highly disorganized with sort of all sorts of sequential errors and substitution errors and blends of action. There's sort of some semblance that what people are doing is the right sort of thing, um, but there's also clearly a lot of things that are going wrong. Um, so here's a patient that was uh, described by Myrna Schwartz. Um, the patient added butter to his coffee. He was in an institutional setting uh, where he was recovering from his uh, stroke. And 
He was provided with a, on a daily basis, his morning breakfast tray had a number of things on it, including a, a mug of hot water that he was meant to make coffee with, a number of condiments that he was meant to use to add to that. Um, he also had, though, a cereal bowl and um, a plate with some toast on it and some jam and so on. Um, and uh, you know, when questioned, though, he insisted that he always took butter in his coffee. So he sort of denied that there was anything wrong with his action. This was sort of what he believed he always did, even though he clearly grimaced as he drank the coffee with the, with the butter in. Um, and similar sorts of problems also can occur uh, with various forms of dementia. Uh, now, some of these errors, many of these errors, can in fact be seen as the sorts of errors that we all make, but much more extreme, much more frequent. So, you know, we all occasionally make these object substitution errors where we put the wrong thing, you know, we... We put the coffee in the fridge instead of the milk or so on. But these patients are doing this uh, on a sort of minute-by-minute minute basis rather than once every you know, day or something like this. Um, sort of slightly similar, but um, I would argue, many, many would argue a, a different disorder is uh, ideational apraxia. And this arises usually from injury to um, left parietal areas, left temporoparietal areas, areas around about here in the, the in right-handers who usually have sort of a certain standard brain organization. Um, and uh, you, know, the, the, you can have sort of damage here due to some kind of stroke, for example, is a fairly common uh, problem. That stroke on the left side often also affects language, which is also um, uh, processed in a similar sort of area. Um, but these patients, they make these sequential errors, but they also make other so-called conceptual errors, um, like um, you know, maybe lighting the wrong end of a candle, um, or when trying to juice an orange, um, as one of the patients that uh, Raffaello Rumiati was talking about, trying to juice an orange and using a serrated knife, which you would normally cut like that, and instead he was trying to push down on the, the orange as if he was cutting butter. Um, another patient um, took a match from the matchbox and he tried to light it by striking it on the inside of the box. So he knew something about striking a match against a matchbox, but didn't know where he should be striking it. Um, then we have other situations like Parkinson's disease and amphetamine psychosis, situations where action um, is sort of well formed, but there's problems with the timing of action. So in Parkinson's disease, um, deliberate initiation of action can be greatly slowed. Amphetamine psychosis is something sort of sometimes seen as the reverse sort of going over this maybe too slowly, so I will try to speed up a little bit. Um, but these different types of error give us insight into the control of routine behavior. So capture errors, I would argue, uh, suggest that action is controlled by these behavioral schemas that may be triggered or activated by context or environment. So a behavior, by a schema, I mean sort of a well-learned uh, sort of sequence of actions that is often performed in the same order um, and uh, you know, we clearly need to abstract away from all of the, the individual uh, grasps and so on that we're using. But if we're, say, making a cup of instant coffee, we always use the, basically the same sort of procedure of boiling the water first, um, maybe sort of adding the coffee granules, adding the milk and adding the sugar. And you know, it doesn't really matter whether we're using milk from a, a little jug or from a, a plastic bottle or whether we're using sugar from a, a sugar sachet or we're using sugar from a sugar bowl, that sort of basic organization is the same. And that's what we mean by these sort of behavioral schemas. Um, now, omission errors, though, suggest that there's some kind of hierarchical organization um, on these, on, uh, these uh, schemas. It's not the case that you leave out, you know, maybe, um, well, occasionally you might leave out the act of, say, opening a sugar sachet when trying to add sugar. But you can also leave out the whole act of adding sugar. So you're making coffee and you normally have sugar in it. You put the coffee in, you put them and maybe stir it and maybe you're interrupted or maybe you're thinking about something else. And then you put the milk in, but you've forgotten to add sugar where you, you normally have sugar. So that whole sort of sub schema of making sugar is a whole separate discrete thing. Uh, and that makes sense that it should be a, dis a separate discrete entity because it's going to be used in lots of different situations. It might be used also when um, making tea. It might be used um, repeated several times if you're making coffee for a friend who takes two sugars or you want, might want to deliberately leave it out if you're making coffee for somebody who doesn't have any sugar. So there's this sort of hierarchical structuring on action schemas. Um, we also know from these perseverative errors, from these situations where we repeat something, 
um, that the immediate memory for action is generally poor. We don't keep tabs on actually on everything we do. If you were to stop somebody you know, mid-flow of some routine task and ask them what did they just do in the last you know, five seconds ago, there's a fair chance that they wouldn't be able to tell you unless they actually reconstructed what they were doing. Um, then we have well, sub substitution errors. They suggest that there's something different about, you know, we've got these action schemas and we've got to somehow bind the argument roles of those schemas. We've got, you know, we've got to apply that schema to a specific uh, coffee mug or a specific sugar packet or whatever. So we've got to somehow associate the schema with the specific objects and that can go wrong as well. So we apply the schema to the wrong object. We apply the, you know, we, um, adding sugar schema to the, the, the wrong target mug um, because we've somehow misbound those two objects. These post-completion errors, they suggest that, goal, that routine behavior is in fact goal-directed, that we are actually trying to achieve goals and that once those goals um, are achieved, then there's kind of a tendency not to carry on or a, a tendency to omit the sort of subsequent, maybe what we might call cleanup actions. Um, and also we had some examples there where one subject sort of said, I, I caught myself just before I made an error. So there's something about monitoring um, which allows us to catch these errors. We're somehow sort of monitoring our behavior in order to sort of um, determine when we're about to make an error. And that monitoring, if it works effectively, can stop us from making the error. Um, and so we can sort of perform normally. So uh, turning to the neural data, that again provides us with sort of insight into the structure or the, the organization, the control of routine behavior. Um, so utilization behavior and anarchic hand syndrome, we see that action schemes may be triggered by aspects of the immediate environment. And maybe they actually have to be inhibited, have to actually be uh, suppressed uh, in normal behavior. So we have to sort of suppress all of these possible things that we can do in order to do the task that we want to do. Um, curiously, one of the things about this anarchic hand syndrome where one hand seems to be performing, you know, uh, driven by the environment, and the other hand is, is sort of under the, the uh, patient's control, um, that seems to pretty much always involve damage to the corpus callosum, the sort of bits of connecting tissue between the left and right hemispheres. So you need sort of somehow damage there, isolated left and right hemispheres, in order to, to get this anarchic hand syndrome, to get one hand to be able to sort of go off and have its own life, if you like. Um, frontal apraxia... Um, also uh, has been interpreted as, as showing problems with monitoring. So again, this patient didn't think there was any problem with adding, buttering, adding butter to his coffee. Um, he thought it was a perfectly natural thing to do. Um, he wasn't able to, uh, you know, despite the fact that he grimaced when he drank it, he didn't think there was uh, an issue there. Um, ideational apraxia. Again, um, the way I'd like to interpret this is suggesting that um, action schemas, the things that, the, the, uh, things that we can perform on objects um, are triggered by those objects um, and that triggering can be interrupted through um, lesions in the temporoparietal cortex, left temporoparietal cortex. And there are also, I should say, there's sort of a lot of imaging studies which I'm not referring to here which support these kind of interpretations. And lastly, these sort of Parkinson's disease disorders of rate, um, they tend to... Um, be related to dopamine depletion or overexcitation of the dopamine system. So there's something about the um, uh, routine action system where it's kind of almost got like a dial that you can turn up the speed. And if that speed's too fast, then you get amphetamine psychosis. If it's too slow, you get Parkinson's disease. And that seems to be related um, to um, uh, dopamine concentration in certain parts of the brain, in basal ganglia. So... Um, what else can we say before we move on to the actual model? Um, let me see. Firstly, when the schema-based routine system is impaired, it, it, you can't override that schema-based system. Behavior is still controlled, but it's not as if you have a deliberate system for controlled behavior and a routine system, and if the routine system doesn't work, you can use a deliberative system. The deliberative system seems to operate by biasing that routine system. So if the routine system is, is impaired, then it causes real problems. You can't just sort of, oh, well, I'll just um, you know, take a, a frontal patient who has an impaired um, 
schema-based system, impaired routine system. They can't just necessarily follow a list of instructions um, because it's actually behavior has to always go through this lower level routine system in the end. Those routines that you might be performing, they might be very small, sort of fine-grained routines you know, at the level of, well, first I'll pick something up, then I'll do this, then I'll do that. Um, or they may be much larger routines as in, I'll make coffee, which has all of these sort of, this substructure, which I don't need to think about. Um, this kind of organization, though, with a low-level routine system and a higher-level system sitting on top of it, biasing it, um, is also very plausible from an evolutionary perspective. Um, one can imagine sort of that the, the routine system is evolutionarily prior, um, with simple life forms um, being entirely schema-driven, lacking a deliberative system. Um, this is certainly the suggestion from uh, some neurologists about uh, how, say, frogs and toads function, that their behavior can be entirely described in terms of schematic operation. Um, but there's also clearly an evolutionary advantage to modulate that routine system in response to non-routine situations. So you could imagine, um, you know, in the uh, dim, distant past, uh, any, any creature that had some simple mechanism, some mechanism that could allow it to um, inhibit the obvious response in a situation may well have an evolutionary advantage over its um, uh, friends or colleagues, I don't know there's a better word for it, over the other organisms uh, that are similar to it. So um, there is an, an evolutionary story that can be told. It's not a story I'm, I'm trying to really tell here, but there is an evolutionary story for this organization of behavior. The theory itself goes back to a model um, proposed by Don Norman and, and Tim Shullis. So Norman was the one who did a lot of the work on um, charting action errors, and Tim Shullis was a, is a cognitive neuropsychologist. I uh, did a lot of work looking at patients and the sorts of errors that they produce. And they developed this model. Um, now it's 30-odd uh, years old. Um, the idea that sensory information comes in through some kind of trigger database, some system, which maps the sensory information into the schemas that we can use. So, you know, objects that can be picked up, switches that can be flicked, and so on. Um, so objects that have these sorts of affordances, things we can do with them. Um, and sometimes those things are very sort of low-level, like just pressing a switch, but other times they might be quite complex behaviours, like, as I say, sort of preparing a, a, a cup of coffee or um, dressing or all of these sorts of things, which can be primed or triggered by situations in the environment. Um, leading to behavior. And that's kind of the, the, the lower level of the model. But sitting on top of that is this system which uh, Norman and Shellis referred to as a supervisory attentional system, or sometimes just the supervisory system, which modulates this low level system um, when uh, we need to actually deliberately control behavior. But critically, that supervisory system also um, is something that is going to be deployed in doing lots of other things. So in performing lots of other sort of more interesting tasks. So if the supervisory system is off daydreaming about something, um, then behavior becomes entirely under the control of contention scheduling, which is fine if you're doing something habitual, if you're doing something which um, can be fully sort of schema driven. But if anything goes wrong, um, or if you know, anything is sort of unexpected, um, then you'll need to get your supervisory system involved as quickly as possible in order to select the appropriate response, select the appropriate behavior. Or if you fail to do that, then you will end up sort of producing all sorts of errors and you know, things may, may well go very wrong. So we've got the beginnings of a theory coming from all of that data from patients and from uh, routine action. Action is controlled by schemas. The schemas are hierarchically organized. They're goal directed. They're triggered by the mental representation of the environment. Um, the activation of schemas is not something we're explicitly aware of. Um, when we apply a schema in a specific situation, we need to bind arguments to the role, argument roles of those schemas. And also we need to you know, choose which hand we're going to use as well. We don't think, should I use my left hand or my right hand to grab something? It's just something that comes naturally. And there are also sort of additional processes which need to sit on top of that um, in order to predict um, and monitor the likely success of action. So. Um, that all sort of leads up to the, the background of this computer model. And the, the original focus of, of study here was to understand um, the behavior of these neurological patients in Myrna Schwartz's rehabilitation clinic in Philadelphia um, who were recovering from frontal injury. 
often from uh, either car accidents um, or, uh, I mean, she was working in a fairly deprived area of Philadelphia and there was, there was sort of a lot of violence and so on. And so there were a lot of people who had suffered uh, brain injury through muggings and, and related sort of issues. Um, but we're looking specifically at how these patients behave when they're trying to make coffee in the morning in their institutional breakfast. It's something they do on a daily basis. The patient might be in, in um, rehabilitation for three months, receiving pretty much the same breakfast tray every morning, um, maybe different cereals and so on, some sort of minor modifications, but always having to make coffee. Um, so we can talk about what are the schemas involved, what are the sort of basic sort of bits of action that are involved, and how are they structured. At the lowest level, there are things like picking up and putting down. Now, somebody who's interested in motor control would be interested in whether we uh, are using a, a pincer grip or a power grip, whether we need to rotate our forearm and grasping and so on. But from the level of, of uh, behavior here, we're not concerned with whether somebody's using the right or the wrong grip. In fact, the patients tend to use the right grip in order to pick up things. Um, so it's simply whether they pick up the right things. So we've got a whole load of these low-level schemas, pick up, put down, tear, unscrew, and so on, which might be relevant to um, preparing coffee. Um, what I've, I've done here is I've broken these up into um, sort of goals and ways of achieving those goals, or goals and methods, as they're sometimes called. And this also um, has a, um, a separate sort of incarnation within artificial intelligence where people talk about what are called and or trees. In order to make coffee, we need to do these three things. But um, in order to add sugar into the coffee, we can do it either this way or this way. We can use either of these methods. That's a goal that can be achieved by a number of different methods. And again, um, the, uh, um, the method adding sugar from packet has a number of goals. And each one of those goals could be, each one of those sub goals, sorry, could be achieved by a number of different methods. So we have this sort of alternation between methods and goals, methods and goals getting up to more complex behavior. Um, so we took this schema hierarchy, which is something we, we designed by hand. We thought about how people perform this task and what's sort of required. Um, and then we developed this into a computational account where schemas, uh, you know, these sort of routine bits of action are associated with nodes within what is called an interactive activation network. So the idea is that with each action schema, we associate a number with that, a numerical value that ranges from 0 to 1. Um, so it can either be inhibit inhibited, close to 0, or highly active, close to 1. And behavior is basically controlled by the things, the schemas that are, are highly active, above threshold, and that threshold might be, say, 0 0.8, close to 1. Um, schemas or schema nodes could be excited, given top-down intentional activation, Intentional, by, by intentional, I mean sort of deliberate. We, we want to do something by the supervisory system. Um, but we also have, so in order to make coffee, you might sort of provide intentional activation to here. Um, and that activation is going to sort of flow down the network um, in order to actually activate the right action at the right time. The trick is getting it to activate the right action at the right time, and then to also get it to activate the objects that are needed at the right time. <coughs> Um, we also have the notion of uh, inhibition. So at the very basic level, I'm sort of trying to avoid um, numbers and formulas as much as possible. But at the very basic level, we might have two schemas that are competing, two alternative ways of doing something. Schema A and schema B. Um, we have what are called lateral, lateral, laterally, well, lateral inhibition connections between the two. So schema A tends to inhibit schema B tends to sort of provide negative excitation or tends to um, tell schema B to, you know, shut up, I want to control behavior. And schema B is the other way around. It says, I want to control behavior. And sort of the standard approach within this interactive activation framework, so sort of a general framework that's used in a range of computational models within psychology, is that the level of this inhibition is dependent upon how active each schema node is. So if schema node A is really active, very highly active, it will inhibit B a lot. Um, whereas if, and if B is, is you know, not very active, if B is quite low in activation, it won't provide much inhibition to A. So what we've got here is two schemas, or two nodes, A and B, um, and initially they're both starting off uh, at the same level of activation, point one here. And I'm applying a little bit more activation to A than to B. Um, I think this is actually sort of 1.1 times, so you know, it might be providing 0.1% 
five units to one and 5.5 units to the other, whatever those units are, that's not really too important. As time goes by, because of these inhibitory connections, mutual lateral inhibitory connections, um, you know, we're providing excitation to both. So both schemas increase in their activation. The red and the blue are increasing in activation here. Um, but A is increasing slightly more quickly than B. And also, because the inhibition is dependent on how active each one is, as A gets more, ac more active than B, it inhibits B more, and B inhibits A a bit less. So we get this separation coming out. A sort of goes up, and it gets to a point where basically A is sort of sufficiently active to inhibit B completely and suppress B altogether. So this is the basic mechanism that goes on at the computational level of this model um, in order to select schemas throughout behavior. Uh, we have an update equation which this is the activation of a schema at time t plus 1 is some function of its input um, and various parameters, which I'm, I'm not going to go into. Um, let's, let's go, so I'm going to go, go back, but what that means is that in a more complex model, so this is a model of um, performing a routine task of juicing an orange, uh, which is a, a task which has been used with a lot of ideational apraxic patients, patients with these left parietal injuries. Um, we get activation evolving over the, the course of um, 360 cycles. Now, you might think of each cycle as a, as a second or a fraction of a second or something like that. And each one of these lines represents a different schema. Um, so we can see that sort of activation of some schemas becomes highly active. Um, then within the context of one schema, say within the context of this schema here, some other schemas become active and then are deactivated. And as time goes by, other schemas are activated and deactivated and so on. What that actually gives us is a situation like this. So, um, as I said, this was the task of juicing an orange, where basically what the subject needs to do is uh, pick up their orange and cut it with a knife, uh, and then squeeze the orange on a, a, an orange squeezer, um, pour it into a cup or a glass, uh, and they may or may not want to drink it afterwards. It's a standard task that's used with these ideational apraxic patients. It's a task which um, some ideational apraxic patients have a lot of difficulty with. But this is the, the normally functioning model applied to this task. <coughs> so it decides, or it selects the schema to prepare juice, selects the first thing to do, cut the orange. The first thing to do is to pick up an implement for cutting. The first thing then to do is to, well, let's look at a, uh, the right implement. It looks at the handle of the knife and picks up the knife handle. Rather than picking up maybe the, the sharp end of the knife, um, which is something that uh, you know, it could have done. Um, so it picks up the knife. It's chosen its left hand. I'm not going to go into the details of why it uses the left hand rather than the right hand. Um, and then it, it sort of realizes that this is achieved. So it, it sort of uh, steps back. Well, it's now achieved this schema. Um, so now it moves on to the next thing, to cut. Okay, so um, it needs to look at the orange because that's the thing that needs to be cut. Um, it then needs to cut that orange by sawing it rather than, say, pushing. Uh, and then uh, that's achieved and it needs to move on to the next thing. Well, it can put down the knife. It's then finished cutting the orange and it can move on to the next subtask. So all of these uh, schemas and actions correspond, the number here is the cycle, that corresponds directly to what's going on here. So this peak here, for example, corresponds, uh, this peak there, which was at about sort of 40-ish cycles in, and then this second peak at about 50 cycles, that corresponds to fixating on the knife handle and then picking up the knife. And all of that is driven basically by um, these processes here of uh, lateral inhibition and top-down activation as well, sort of um, activating the, the, the things that we need to do at different points in time. Now, going into a little bit more detail about other aspects of the model, um, we need an internal representation of the world. We need a representation of what's available for us to do, to, uh, you know, to objects to act upon. Um, so... It's not just schemas that have activation values. We also have some kind of representation of objects. Objects can be more or less salient. Um, so they also have activation values. And those saliences, those activation values, relate to different argument roles. So an object can be highly salient as a target. Um, so you know, the, the dirty coffee mug was a highly salient target because it had just been used um, to, to dispose of something. It becomes a highly salient target for the, um, performing the next action. 
So it, while it's a highly salient target, there might be another highly salient source, which was the sugar packet which was poured into it. Um, so the critical thing is to make sure that objects and the schemas are active at the same time, that the right schema is active at the, right, at the same time as the right object. If a schema is very active and the wrong object is active, um, then we'll apply the schema, we'll bind the, the argument roles of the, the schema to the wrong objects. Um, here's a sort of a little illustration of how this, this relation between schemas and object representation works uh, within the, that task of juicing an orange. Um, so one of the sub-goals of preparing the orange juice is to cut the orange. Um, so our goal is to cut the orange. There are many different ways of achieving this cutting goal. If we're cutting butter, we could cut by pushing. If we're cutting you know, something that's like an orange, we have to cut by sawing. So this schema activates both. It provides some top-down activation to both, and it leaves the environment to decide what's the appropriate way to cut this orange. Now the orange, in the representation of the environment, is sort of activating various other things. It's activating completely irrelevant schemas like bounce. One of the things we can do with the orange is bounce it on the table, for example. And certainly some of the patients, they will do that. Um, rather than preparing juice, they just sort of bounce the orange. And maybe that's a sensible thing to do because you want to sort of soften the orange up before you squeeze it and get the juice out. Maybe. But so the representation of orange is activating this schema, but this schema is not necessarily task relevant. It's also activating the cut by soaring, but it's not activating cut by pushing because we don't cut oranges by pushing. We have, we've never, uh, we've not learnt that. Our sort of past experience, the accumulated life experience of dealing with, of cutting oranges is that we saw them with a serrated edge knife. So that's why there's this um, excitation between here and here. So the high level schema is simply saying we need to cut. The environment is saying how we need to cut. And that actually ends up being very important for explaining some of the patient errors. Um, so why should we use this sort of method of computational simulation though. Why simulate? Um, part of the, the difficulty is that um, some psychological theories without computational models attached to them uh, can be very vague, sort of inconsistent, hand wavy. They tend to be, um, uh, let me see, most productive in the hands of the person who developed the theory. And that's not a good situation for science. You want a theory to be something that um, other people can understand and use and make predictions from rather than it simply being the province of the person who uh, came up with the theory in the first place. Um, it's also the case that um, we're not, when we have vague, uh, vague theories specified just in language, in English or whatever, um, there may be theoretical inconsistencies. So trying to simulate, trying to develop computational models as a way of getting rid of those or isolating those theoretical inconsistencies and um, sort of coming down one side or the other. Uh, we can also isolate holes in the theory. One of the problems with the original theory developed by Norman and Chalice of this contention scheduling and supervisory system model um, was that they didn't really consider how the representation of the world or the binding of objects fitted in. So by developing this computational model, um, we were able to extend that theory looking at these different aspects. There are some methodological problems. I don't think there's time to sort of go into them. They're sort of a little bit arcane. But there certainly are methodological problems and we need to be aware of those or sensitive to those in the methodologies that we're using. Let me though tell you a bit more about the functioning of the model and simulating behaviour. As I said, this is simulating normal functioning of juicing an orange. We see the scheme is sort of being activated and, and inhibited over time. Um, at the same time, this is the representation of uh, implements within the world, the representation of objects. Um, and we can see that different implements are being activated at different times. So for a long time, the thing that we want to use is the knife, and that implement is being activated. Um, but then we get to a phase in the task where the, thing, the implement we want to use is the juicer. So because of the relationship between schemas and objects, and the hierarchical relationships between schemas, um, we have this situation that once the knife is, is uh, no longer needed, um, the next schema can become, the next implement can become active. Um, and we can get situations where, uh, with impairments, to the, when we're simulating impairments, where that kind of process goes wrong. Um, let me talk, though, about this idea of simulating impairments. So basically, we have a computational model, a, computation, a, a computer program that produces output 
uh, like this. Well, simultaneously, it produces this and this, um, sort of a sequence of actions. Um, but we're interested in, in understanding not just normal action, but we're also interested in understanding this breakdown of action following neural damage. How do we model that? Well, in sort of the, the, we do the obvious thing. We break our computer program, but we try to break it in a way that's justified by sort of theoretical uh, considerations. So one of the theoretical considerations about utilization behavior is that it results from uh, impaired top-down control from the supervisory system into the contention scheduling system. So we're able to do to simulate this by um, impairing the high-level activation that flows into the network. And if we do that, then sure enough, the model produces behavior which is controlled by the environment or under the influence strongly of the environment rather than of um, the desired goal. Um, a second thing that we were interested in simulating was this action disorganization syndrome or frontal apraxia. Um, the data here are, um, I mean, the data in this, this domain is, is, is a difficult sort of, um, let's see, it's a difficult thing to get a handle on. But one set of data comes from, uh, as I say, Myrna Schwartz's patients. So she had a series of patients in this rehabilitation clinic. Um, this is data from 30 consecutive admissions with uh, frontal head injuries, performing um, a well-specified but fairly routine task. And she videotaped people performing this task um, in a controlled environment and then scored the types of errors, looked at the exact sequence of behaviors they produced and scored the errors that they produced. She then rated them from lowest to highest in a, on an accomplishment score, how well they actually achieved the final goal, um, which is the, the organization from lowest to highest here. Um, but what you can see is the people who are poorest you know, um, are making many more of these emission errors so the black bars are emission errors. Uh, they, all, they make a few substitution errors, but substitution errors don't seem to increase with severity. Similarly, sub, um, sequence errors sorry, don't increase with severity, and substitution errors don't increase with severity. So that's kind of the key empirical effect that we can look at within this model. Um, so here's data from the model, which we, we simulated this um, disorder by increasing noise within the uh, schema network. So what I haven't mentioned is that for each of these activation levels, each schema node, um, it's not that it has a, you know, it might be an active, active to 0.7 or something, plus or minus a little bit. So plus or minus a little bit of noise, random noise that sort of, um, uh, sort of affects processing on every single cycle. Um, if noise is increased, and one suggestion is that this is the, one of the problems that these frontal um, apraxic or action disorganization patients have. They, they can't sort of um, focus their activation sufficiently on the intended um, schemas, and there's a little bit of variability between what's, how that activation is being focused. Um, then this is what the model produces. Um, and this is done in a, um, there's kind of a lot of statistics to the procedure behind this, but again, producing... Um, 30 instances of the model with increasing sort of severity. Um, I didn't sort of cheat by just trying to find ones that sort of matched best, but basically as, it, as severity increases, um, there's maybe a slight tendency to perform more object substitutions, but there's certainly um, this general tendency for an increased number of emission errors. Um, I also scored in green here these addition errors which weren't scored in the original study. Okay, we've also then looked at simulating ideational apraxia, um, this syndrome that seems to um, occur following damage to the left parietal cortex, or left temporoparietal uh, junction. Um, and we're looking at two patients in particular. These ideational apraxic patients are um, more, much more rare than the frontal apraxic or action disorganization patients. But by looking at the relationship between schemas and object representations um, and impairing that relationship, um, we're able to account for um, some different error patterns in different types of ideational apraxic patients. Some who tend to make lots more errors in locating their actions. They apply the right action, but in the wrong place, like striking the match inside the matchbox. Others will use tools in the wrong way, like trying to um, cut the orange by pushing rather than soaring. So again, we're able to simulate um, that sort of uh, pattern of behavior. 
Um, and we've also simulated these disorders of rate, things like amphetamine psychosis and um, the problems that some Parkinson's patients have. So this graph shows, as we vary, one of the key parameters, um, basically how strong that lateral inhibition is between competing schemas. And as we vary one of the key parameters, this is the, the task onset and task completion. The important thing is that this distance um, doesn't vary very much, but this distance, task onset, varies enormously. So as the uh, parameter comes down here, as lateral inhibition is, um, uh, well, as there's too much lateral inhibition or insufficient uh, self-activation, which is a sort of converse concept, um, action initiation becomes greatly slowed. So um, I realize it's 8 o'clock, and I, I knew I was um, going to have too much material. Um, let me, though, I think rather than going through the theoretical implications, let me briefly talk about implications for uh, rehabilitation. Um, I think I said at the beginning that lists of instructions for common tasks are not really sufficient for rehabilitation. They don't provide, because patients have problems with monitoring, simply giving them a list of what they should be doing is not necessarily going to help. Um, repairing schema knowledge by explicit rote learning, by telling people, this is basically the same point, simply telling people what they should do is not sufficient either. It doesn't help them. Um, in fact, the most successful um, procedures here in rehabilitation focus on rote learning of the precise procedure. So relearning a, a, you know, a, a previous schema um, effectively from scratch in an environment where there is no variation, where there is always exactly the same procedure to be followed. So as soon as there's sort of um, different environmental contingencies to be taken into account, um, that causes problems. Equally, giving, people, giving patients feedback on their errors is not helpful. Having uh, you, the, the rehabilitation needs to focus on learning the precise procedure, errorless learning, so-called errorless learning. Um, we should also ensure, obviously, that home environments are designed to minimize distractions so that unnecess you know, unnecessary objects or whatever don't capture behavior. Because, again, um, if there are other objects around, they, lead, they don't necessarily lead to performing actions on those objects. In fact, some of the studies show that they can perform simply having additional objects around leads you to omit more of your intended actions. And that's a, um, a, a situation that is replicated in the model as well. Um, tools should be designed so that they have these sort of strong affordances. It's very clear what their, their purpose is, clear without even thinking about it. The, the nature of the tool tells us what it is. And um, we can also look at smart devices designed to monitor action slips. This idea of um, tools having strong affordances is maybe illustrated by this um, thing, which I had not seen before I read the paper on it. Um, maybe people in the audience know what that's for. If you don't know what it's for, I bet you know how to use it. You know, you, you know that you squeeze this thing. Um, actually, it's for deseeding olives or cherries, or I guess grapes that have seeds in as well. Um, but it's very clear what, the, what action is associated with this object. So designing tools in the right way um, provides some kind of handle on how to use those tools. And we've got to sort of be aware of that for artifact design as well. I mean, one of the things that you know, we're seeing increasing numbers of um, s smart devices and so on, but smart devices aren't very useful if they're also not intuitive in how to use them. If you give somebody an iPad and they've never seen an iPad before, you know, it's got no buttons on it, what do you do with it? Um, so um, you need to sort of make systems that actually uh, are sort of more user friendly than that. In fact, the sort of the state of the art for um, smart devices for rehabilitation focus on actually doing very complex image recognition, recognizing what the patient is doing in performing a task, recognizing when there is an error, and then being able to um, tell the patient what to do in order to correct that error, what they should be doing instead. And that's a very, very complex sort of thing. It's not a, a simple situation of just following a sequence of instructions. The, the, the device has to actually you know, do a lot of image processing to understand what's going wrong. Okay, um, let, me, let me, I think, finish there because it is five past eight um, and um, you know, there is sort of additional work that I've been doing with colleagues on sort of extending um, this model of routine action to non-routine situations. But let me end and thank um, this, uh, I, th I think that's everyone who's been involved in this work over the years. Okay, thank you.
Yes, I mean, some of those disorders can be seen as problems in the top-down control of behaviour because your attentional systems are involved in maybe, you know, if you're highly anxious, for example, um, or um, you know, monitoring the environment for other things, preventing you from therefore monitoring your own internal cognitive systems. And therefore you end up um, being excessively uh, driven by the environment, driven by the, um, you, by the affordances of objects around you. So, yes. <laughs> it is actually quite, uh, quite similar. I have a 14-month-old um, baby, and it's <laughs> both my wife and I are, are making all sorts of errors. I mean, um, you know, at, at various times over the last year, um, yes, we've produced a lot more of these sorts of errors, and it, it's, it's very similar. Um, uh, and actually, there's a lot of work also by um, people working, say, for the US Air Force who are interested in how to maintain pilots' attention. I mean, in the case of the US Air Force, it's how to maintain pilots' attention while they fly 10 hours across to where they need to drop their bombs or whatever. But, you know, how to um, uh, sort of, um, yeah, I guess just maintain attention on a task or ensure that um, sleep deprivation doesn't lead to these sorts of cognitive errors. And some of that we can design into the artifacts that we're using so that the you know, flight uh, cockpits can have the right sort of automi automatization or the right sorts of things in order to um, stop us from making these sorts of errors. Um, but in other cases, it, it's, it's you know, a really difficult design issue that has to be sort of confronted by the designer to pre prevent these sorts of errors. Um, one of the actual problems with um, the increasing automi automatization of things like flight cockpits is that it means that pilots become less engaged with flying um, and then when things go wrong it actually takes them much longer to to work out what's going wrong so in some sense the the old-fashioned days where the pilot needed his or her full attention um, to the task were actually um, in some ways safer than a lot of the automatization any more questions if not i'd thank i'd thank rick once again for a very interesting lecture Thank you.